I'm glad you all turned out tonight. You're just waiting after last week to see what's going to come out. Josh, are you going to fix our sign, Josh? That's going to be on TV. It needs to be fixed. Yeah, we can just take it off. This side. This side. We can just do that. Okay, to clear up a few things from last week, I said something about a Koran instead of a Torah. I know it's a Torah. And we'll get into that a little more later. Uh, in case those of you listening are not familiar with what a Koran is, that's the Islam faith that Muslims believe in, and it's the teachings of Muhammad. And um, he couldn't even rewrite, and his followers actually wrote it after he left, uh, died left this earth in about 632 AD, and that's all I'm going to say about that. And I'll get into that other later. Uh, in answer to Brother Ken's question, yes, in um, John chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, he does say a lad brought the five fish and three loaves, but it was Andrew that acquired that for Jesus and came to him and said, there is a lad that has five, you know, so it was him who brought that. <coughs> So we concentrated them from the lad. Yeah, it, the lad did uh, bring them to the, the, there, and then it was Andrew that searched that out. And that and that was a point that we were trying to make last week, is that Andrew was just faithfully available and useful, and uh, even though he wasn't one of the more um, written about uh, disciples or in the gospel, he, he was a mightily used you don't have to have a specific talent or something that you're famous for like many of the others and uh, that God can use you any, with anything you have to give <clears throat> so this is the second week of our study of the book of Mark and just like many authors some authors start their books with a a fast-paced uh, event that happens and then they go back with little flashes to tell you what led up to that event while others tell you genealogy and background and that's what Matthew and Luke did as well as John and Mark was just it's almost like I could just see him he must have been ADHD but you know everything is fast-paced fast focused and it said that of the uh, four Gospels Mark's was the shortest that's probably because he just highlighted all the miracles, had to get on with it. And it said that Mark and Luke said that his gospel was a little rough around the edges, and their stories smoothed it out and gave more detail. And as we've seen, that's what happened. But Mark did write with a lot of power and energy, and it was always accurate, so much so that Peter asked him to be his interpreter when he went to Rome. <clears throat> and Many feel that the church and Mark and Luke and even Peter accepted um, Matthew. They accepted Mark's gospel because it was um, it was so accurate. And the fact that being uh, Peter's interpreter, he had a lot of Peter's um, gospel or his teachings behind him. He supported a lot of um, of what Mark or a lot. Of a lot of what Peter had said. So it said that uh, he was influenced, Mark's gospel was influenced by what uh, Peter's ministry. And it also said that uh, Mark had, I'm sorry, that uh, Luke's gospel had, what was it, 350 verses that were exact quotes from Mark's gospel. So that's how much he believed in Mark's gospel. And uh, that was in Luke. And uh, something that Brother Kim brought up last week is why wasn't Mark's evangelism journey as much heard about. And uh, we did hit on the fact that uh, Mark did not complete his journey with Barnabas and Paul. And that's because Mark left them in Pamphylia. They didn't leave him. Mark left them in, in Pamphylia, and that left them shorthanded. And Paul was not happy about that. And so he was getting ready to have another missionary journey and to go back to visit some of the other previously uh, towns that's where they uh, converted people. And so Barnabas said, well, let's get my cousin, my little cousin, Luke, or Mark, because uh, he was young at that time. And Paul said, no, I, I need good help, and I'm afraid he may do that again. And so that's when Paul and Barnabas split. Paul took Silas to go with him on that 
journey. And then uh, Barnabas went and got his cousin, uh, Mark, and and they went on the journeys together. So that that's how that happened, of how him leaving him. But as we know then, just from what I previously said, then he went on to be an interpreter of Peter, and so he was well used. But our lesson for this week is Jesus confronts religious leaders. Throughout the gospel, Jesus faced more opposition from religious leaders than those outside the Jewish community. It said, those who had studied the law as well as the prophets who had received the promise of Jesus' coming and claimed to be waiting for the Messiah. All of them you would have thought would have embraced what Jesus was saying, but they did not. They refused to believe that he was the Messiah, and he just didn't come looking like what they thought he was. And then when he did come, he challenged all their traditions that they held very closely to them. They thought this was very important. Do any of you know of any traditions you have in your family that it's things you do and you've always done them that way and your mom did them that way and grandma did them that way or grandfather, whatever, and that's, you really never thought about doing it a different way. That's just how you think You think of anything? Some people, you gave an example here of, of maybe the way you make your bread or pie crust, which you don't do a lot anymore, but the way, just the way you do things, it's like, why do you do that? It's like, I don't know. My mom always did it. My grandma did too. I've got one. Okay. When I used to go stay with my grandma and grandpa in Tennessee, uh, my grandpa would always pour his coffee in a saucer. Yeah. I never understood that, but he did. That's what he did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, does anyone else have any more? Have any? Mom always went on the campus and pour all the juice out. Mix it with water, put more water, water in it. Yeah, when you ask him, it's like, I don't know, I it was just the way it was always done. And when you get older, sometimes you you uh, see that there is a better way or a different way, and it's um, and sometimes you adapt to that. And then there's sometimes it's like, I just can't bring myself to do that. We've just always done it. My grandmother, there wasn't much water. <laughs> she would have a fit if you didn't uh, rinse out your tea that you made cornbread. You could any month rinse that out so you didn't have nothing to do with the water. My mother did that and I said, <laughs> I can remember my grandmother always spring and fall cleaning. And my mom spring and fall clean. And I spring and fall clean. And then I got or in the side, I didn't even do that much anymore. So there's things that, you know, as we get older, we, you know, not that it wasn't good, and it really is, but um, that we've gotten away with. But my mom always did it, and she said because her mother did it, and her grandmother always did it. But that's the way it was with these religious leaders. There were a lot of traditions, and they considered themselves to be the guardians of those Jewish traditions and the faith. And it was very important to them because they were living in occupied Rome at that time. They were under Roman rule. And so these long-held traditions weren't usually enforced. And so these was li religious leaders then, that was, that's what their job was then. They would help. However, some of their issues that uh, concerned Jesus were the fact that they were holding on and um, enforcing traditions that they had made, not that God had made. <laughs> And so it was not the law, and, they, and so Jesus would challenge those laws. Jesus came to bring salvation from sin and new life in the Spirit. And there were times during his ministry, it said, when the voices of legalism opposed his work. People just adapted to the man-made laws. They liked those better, or the human additions. And so uh, God had, or Jesus had to challenge those because they were added to God's commands. What had happened is we had the Ten Commandments and the people were coming out of um, exile and they just didn't want to have to go into exile again. And so the priests made all these other commandments to help them understand just how you <clears throat> have to uh, uphold that particular law. And um, there were a lot of them. I think it was 613 positive ones, 635 negative things. That shall not but they were man-made. 
And so this lesson is going to explore the challenges that help us to recognize and deal with the obstacles in our lives and some of the traditions that we may have been taught when we were younger about our faith and religion. The Messiah, as I said, had come to provide forgiveness from sin and reconciliation with the Father. That is his main purpose. And we know that he provided healing and deliverance at times when people showed great faith. He just, that was how he honored that faith. And we saw that last week in the synagogue when the man was healed or delivered from the demons, but, uh, and also Peter's mother-in-law was healed with that fever. So we did see that. But it led to a lot of people and a lot of fame. And there's a lot of people followed him everywhere he went. He was becoming so famous that it was hard for him to do his number one thing, which was to provide forgiveness of sin and reconciliation to the Father. He wanted to preach. He wanted to bring those to salvation. He had a limited time to do it. And everywhere he went, people wanted healed and delivered. So the event that I want to tell you about now, uh, Jesus was being followed by a great crowd, and he went into this man's house. And there was a great crowd outside, and these men, and I know you've heard the story, it was about the four men that brought their friend who was paralyzed and on a cot. And they were not deterred. They just knew if they could see Jesus, if he could see them, that he would heal their friend. They knew it. They, they didn't have any qualms about it, any doubts about it. And so what they did was to climb the ladder to the top of the house. It was common to have a ladder on the outside of your house. The roofs were flat. They were made of clay and branches, and they were sturdy. And this was just an extension of their home. And oftentimes they would have a trap door even, so that once you were up there, you could come down through the trap door. And the scripture does say that. It said that he enlarged, once they enlarged the hole, brought it down. Well, you have to have a hole before you can enlarge it. So apparently there was a trap door there. So when they came down and Jesus saw them, he immediately, just like many other times, he felt their faith and, their, and saw the perseverance of getting close to him. And so he honored that and said, son, your sins are forgiven. But he didn't come to get his sins forgiven. He came to get healed, right? So that's where the problem all started. The <coughs> religious leaders that were there and they uh, they got to thinking about it and they thought, this, this can't be. This, this is against our laws. And uh, Jesus had made it very clear that your sins were sometimes tied to your, uh, your level of forgiveness from God. And so the, the level of forgiveness of God was the primary need. And so it said at times there's a relationship between a person's sin and their sickness. James encourages us to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Pray for each other so you may be healed. And if, uh, I remember right under the law and everything, uh, sin could be passed out for me. Yes. Uh, and that might have been saved for me. Yes. For the reason he was told you that. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I read a, a scripture this week, you know, about the... the the little boy was blind since birth, and then the, the disciples said, Who sinned? His mom or him? And Jesus said, No, no, no. But, and it didn't say a whole lot more. So, you know, it could have been that it was from, from other uh, generations. But it says, The prayer of a righteous person, or as my Bible always said, the prayer of uh, a righteous person is you know, effectual, it's powerful, ineffective. And so the, the key word there is a righteous person. It doesn't say the prayer of a person. It's a righteous person. If you're righteous, that means that your faith is in Jesus Christ and nothing else. And so it said, however, we must be very careful, though, that if someone is sick, it may not be tied to sin in their body. We just have to be very careful of that. But that's why you pray for each other. And it said that uh, we, we can pray for each other. We can't. Uh, we can't uh, take their sin away. Only Jesus could do that. Yeah. And the, it said only God can forgive sins. And that was true. And that was central to the Jewish belief. 
And that was the reason that these teachers of the law reacted so strongly to the words. It said, no human can rightfully claim to forgive sins. And if you do so, you're claiming to be God. And that's why the teachers thought that Jesus was, uh, by him forgiving these sins, that he was blasphemous. And they were right in that. If he were a man, it would have been blasphemous, but he wasn't. He was God. And so he was correct. Now, the men believed in Jesus. The four people that brought him in, they believed in Jesus, but they may not have had a relationship with him. You know, there's a lot of people that go to church and they believe there is a God, but they don't have a relationship. And they know he does good things. And so... Um, I think that's why Jesus, you know, Jesus uh, detected right away this man's sin, his sickness was due to sin in his life, or he wouldn't have forgiven him of his sins before he healed him. But when Jesus spoke of forgiveness to the man in need, the religious leaders were appalled. And so Jesus pretty well put it right back in their face. He said, you know, to forgive them of their sins was invisible. And that was his authority shown invisibly. So I can tell you right now, I forgive you of your sins. You don't know that it happened. And that's the way these men were. And that's the way Jesus understood it. He said, oh, so you think that forgiving them of their sins is, is, more, is easier than healing them? And then that's what he did. He turned around and told the guy, get up and walk. Take your bed and go home. And so he was just shoving it in their face. He was... Uh, this miracle was an outward sign of Jesus' authority to forgive sins, an authority that they had rejected. They had a problem with that. But this was an outward sign that he had the ability to do spiritual healing as well. And the scripture, uh, scriptures on sickness began with the fall of humankind in the Garden of Eden as part of the death that resulted from the sin there with uh, Adam and Eve. And so forgiveness and healing are also connected to numerous times in the Bible. One in particular is Isaiah 53, verses 14 and 15. No, 4 and 5. And uh, it says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised. And we esteemed him not. And surely he was born for our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we didn't esteem him. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we were healed. So in that, those scriptures, those verses right there, it puts forgiveness of sin as well as healing together. And it shows us that he atoned for that on the cross, both of them. But what the Israelites and the, the Jewish people believed is that uh, Jesus Christ was accursed. Because Moses had said, um, For he who is hanged is accursed of God, in Deuteronomy 21, uh, verse 23. And they didn't understand that he was not accursed uh, for, his sin, for his sins because he didn't have any. But he was made cursed for our sins. And there wasn't a suffering that Jesus Christ went through. All the brutal beatings and all that. It was all for us. He, he was willing to do it all for us. And so the healings, you know, it was all for us. And it was atoned on the cross to provide forgiveness as well as physical healing. But this particular incident that we're talking about now, about uh, the man being lowered down and healed, this happened before the crucifixion. But Jesus was shown doing a physical healing as well as a spiritual healing before he ever had his ascension. So this demonstrated his ability to perform spiritual healings while here on earth. That's forgiveness as well as uh, physical healings. Now the skeptics probably were astounded, but they couldn't doubt what had just happened. I mean, they saw a man that was paralyzed and now he's healed. Even his uh, disciples and people that were following Jesus were saying, we've never seen anything like this. And so um, he, was, he met with amazement and praise, it said in Mark uh, 2.12. It says, these acts of forgiveness and healing drew more attention to Jesus Christ's identity as the Son of Man. 
And so Jesus went on after this time when people were coming to realize he probably really was a son of man. He used it 81 times in just the four Gospels, uh, talking about himself. And it was used outside of the Gospel, son of man, by Daniel and Stephen and the, he and the Hebrews and John. But that's when he started becoming called the son of man to show his identity. Now, when traditions were challenged, and we talked about this before, the, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, said, okay, that, that's us, that's me, that's what I do. And they held tightly to those traditions. And they were very adamant when they were challenged to defend them. The problem was, is that these uh, Jewish faith and traditions, that was all the laws, all the ceremonies and festivities, um, they were, they were a lot of the things that they had made up. And what they didn't realize is a lot of things that they were defending were the very, they were defending them to God or to Jesus, who was the very one who came to fulfill all of those Ten Commandments so that they could live that way. And so uh, they, they didn't see that. All they saw are rules and regulations. Now this next uh, story is about Matthew or Levi. It refers to him as Levi, but it was the same person. And he was a tax collector, right? So it says, shortly after calling Levi to follow him, Jesus went to Levi's house for a meal. But if you read further, it was more like a real party. He was celebrating the fact that Jesus wanted him as one of his disciples. He was very happy about that. And it records that there were many tax collectors and sinners who were now following Christ. And so they were invited to this party as well. Some of them, because Matthew was a tax collector, he had invited them to the party just because they were his friends. They didn't particularly need to be following God at this time. But he was excited for the next chapter in his life, and he wanted them to be there. And so he invited uh, these tax collectors and sinners, which at that time were a group. That was just one group. Sinners and tax collectors were just pretty well synonymous. Jewish tax collectors were seen as outcasts in the eyes of the Jews. They saw them as working with the occupying force of Rome. And if you remember, a lot of times these tax collectors went they didn't do the tax collecting. They got slaves to do it for them, and then they took their cut. They asked for a lot more than what the, the leadership was wanting, and that's what uh, hurt the people. They didn't have the money to give him anyway, and so they, here are these tax collectors are taking more than what it, the, the leadership was asking for them to do. But the tax collectors were not seen, they were seen as traitors and collaborators with the enemy. They were forbidden, so the leadership didn't uh, think much of them either because they were uh, forbidden to be witnesses in legal matters. And their status was extended to their spiritual community as well. They were not forbidden to go into synagogue, but the Jewish people, if they knew who you were, they didn't want you in their synagogue. And if you gave money to the synagogue, their alms, they said, we don't need your kind of money. So they were not well thought of at all. But just like Ken said last week, Jesus didn't bring those that weren't that well thought of or uh, rich that could further his cause and give him favor in the eyes of the law. So here we had another unlikely candidate being one of the disciples. But as we know, God equips those he calls. He doesn't call those that are already equipped. And here you have one in front of you. He just calls you. Another category with whom Jesus said they were eating was the sinners. So we talked about tax collectors. Now these sinners, the Bible is very clear in saying all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have come short of the glory of God. So he's talking about everybody. But when they said they were eating with sinners and tax collectors, they were referring to people that were blatantly sinners, long-standing. They were adulterers, thieves, and prostitutes is who they were referring to. And so those who opposed Jesus on this occasion were the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, and they felt they knew who these people were and what they represented. And so they didn't talk to Jesus directly. They talked to the disciples and said, why is he eating and socializing with these tax collectors and sinners. Well, 
Jesus took that as an opportunity to, uh, he heard them, you know, just like in Pastor's Prayer tonight, you know, God knows before we ever ask, and Jesus knew then that uh, what these men were saying, and he said, many people considered themselves already righteous, and they have no need of salvation. But those who admit that they are sinners, which should be everyone, he said, they are ready to receive all that Christ offers. So what he was saying, I'm not here as their friend. I'm not here as their buddy. I'm here as their spiritual physician. If they were whole, there would be no need for me to be in their presence. But they're not. And if you think that you are, you are self-righteous. And they showed their self-righteousness when they said, he doesn't need them here. Now, uh, Jesus, though, was doing exactly what I said in the beginning. He was coming to um, reach out to the sinners. So he, his ministry was simple. You know, he mainly just wanted to reach the sinners so that they have salvation and reconciliation with his Father. Well, Jesus continued uh, to depart from the accepted norms of many of the religious leaders on that day. And now he'd been observed of eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. So the next thing you want to say is, okay, and not only are you eating with sinners and tax collectors, but you're not fasting. Now, they'd already arrested um, John the Baptist, and, but he still fasted in prison. And the Pharisees and the leadership were where they could see that he was fasting. And they said his disciples are fasting, the Pharisees are fasting, but you guys don't fast. Well, Jesus went back to them and he said, you leaders, you're just wanting to enforce um, the laws that uh, pertain to you, that fits your needs. And he said the law was created for trans to make people aware of transgressions against God, not society. And so he said uh, the Torah was created to bring that to their remembrance and so that their lives would be changed, that they saw that they were had transgressions against God, that they would change their life and their heart would be changed, and they would make a commitment to follow fully all the law. So it wasn't to cherry pick as the uh, leadership was doing to which laws that they were going to pass. They said, yeah, I all or nothing. This is what you do, and that's why the law was even created, the law that you are uh, quoting. So what he told them is he said, that uh, when asked about why he and his disciples didn't fast, Jesus compared his time here on earth to a wedding celebration. And uh, he said, I am the bridegroom. And then he said that his uh, disciples were his guests. Now, teaching lessons, anytime Jesus would teach a lesson, it was always something relatable, something that people had already experienced before. So they knew that if he compared it to a Jewish wedding, a Jewish wedding celebration usually lasts for days at a time. And so they were, um, and when you thought of a Jewish celebration, it was a lot of joy. There was not fasting. And in fact, fasting usually has to do with mourning, something that's not going well in your life. And um, so he was, so he said to them uh, that, there was really no need for fasting because they were with the bridegroom, and so fasting would really be inappropriate as long as the bridegroom were present. He said, the ministry of Jesus Christ brings blessings of forgiveness, entry into God's kingdom, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Those are all reasons for great joy in someone's life, and there will be a time when the bridegroom, when Jesus is not in their presence, to be with them. And there would be a time for fasting then after he ascended into heaven. And we know that his followers then did fast. He compared it, the new life that he was giving to them as standing in contrast to what they already had. And that's why they were so full of joy. It's because they had been done under great oppression by this Roman rule. And he said it's just like when you put new wine into a wineskin. And if it's an old wineskin, during the process of fermentation, then it would burst the wineskin. Or if you would take a new patch and put on an old piece of cloth that it would pull away. And so he said that's the same way at the experience of salvation. It should change the convert to where they uh, so dramatically that they get rid of the old in their life to allow room for the new. Well, 
Again, the Pharisees opposed Jesus because he was not conforming to their legalistic regulations. And again, Jesus had to remind them of his of the human need. He said, the human need is much greater than all those man-made rules that we have that the Pharisees are defending so, especially on keeping the Sabbath. And so this uh, incident happened with uh, Jesus walking through a grain field. Now in the Bible it says he walked through a corn field. But if you do research, it said they didn't have corn in that part of the country, that it was just trans that was translation, that it was a grain, just like corn, but it was probably barley and wheat. And what they would do is go through and get the, the kernels off of the stalks and, and rub them between the hands and eat the, the kernel like nuts. And this was something that they were allowed to do, even though it was Sunday. Uh, it said such an act was allowed by the law in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 24 and 25. It said that you can go into a neighbor's vineyard and eat all you want, or in your neighbor's grain field, and eat all you want, but you can't cut it down and you can't take extra with you in a vessel for your journey. You just, you're allowed to eat what you can while you're there. Well, the Pharisees didn't see is that they went beyond the Old Testament and the New Testament for that matter, but they went beyond what was written in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. And Jesus could have taken them back there, but here again is no, another one of those man-made laws. They had something called the Mishnah. And this reflected Jewish tradition as we, uh, of the Jewish oral law. And so that was what was considered as the authoritative word at that time. And so according to that, the disciples had been forbidden to eat and to gather this wheat on Sabbath. But Jesus brought the Israelites uh, back to where they, they respected David, King David. So he took him back to a time in their history when uh, God established the practices of worship in the tabernacle. It specified that 12 loaves of bread be placed before Jesus on every Sabbath in the temple. The bread was to be a gift to God from the 12 tribes of Israel commemorating God's provision for their needs. And then following this presentation, this commemoration, then it could be eaten, but only by the priest. And uh, so he went on to, so that's something they accepted. They knew that, they knew the 12 loaves were to be presented. But then in Samuel 21, verses one through six, it tells how David was on the run from King Saul. He had, had obtained that consecrated bread from the tabernacle to share with these men. This was an act that allowed, uh, that was allowed by the presiding priest at that time, and Jesus noted that the actions of David's party were justified because in that Mishnah, it said that the only way that you were allowed to do any work was if you were saving someone's life. And so Jesus said this: these actions were justified because they were preserving life on the Sabbath. And so they didn't have anything to say. And Jesus reminded the Pharisees that God had made the Sabbath for man so that he could be physically and spiritually refreshed, as well as the animals. And as the Son of Man had the authority to forgive sins, then he had the authority to overrule wrong ideas about the Sabbath as well. Now, it was appropriate to keep the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Number four. Ten Commandments. So Jesus did say that. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And it was an important part of the Jewish tradition. God commanded the Sabbath to be <clears throat> holy, and the Pharisees just expanded on that commandment just a little bit more in case people didn't really understand how you were to keep the Sabbath holy. And Jesus continued to challenge your thinking because they added a lot of man-made rules for that. Jesus further illustrated his lordship over the Sabbath in Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, when he encountered a man needing healing in the synagogue. There was this man that came to the synagogue every week and he had a little bit of The Pharisees knew he'd be there. They knew Jesus would be there. And so they were all keeping their eye on Jesus because they knew now he had the ability to heal this man. But would he do it on the Sabbath? And if he did, we got him. They were going to be watching and catching him and violating one of their traditions, which they held that, like I said, aid to someone if they were in dire situations, it was a life and death matter, and this man with a withered arm was not life and death. 
So unlike the other healings, though, Jesus had performed away from the crowds, and he told him, don't tell anybody, because he had enough people following him as it was. He used this incident to be a, a um, teachable moment. He held the man up, put him in a position to where everyone could see him. And um, it says he's, he wanted to set this lesson up to teach. So he said to the listeners, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill someone, rather than give a response to that, which they knew Jesus could come back and they didn't want him to have another reason to come back and prove them wrong again, it said the Pharisees did not respond. So Jesus taught that them that of the necessity of doing good at all times, whether it came on the Sabbath or not. Today, we have that same responsibility. We are under an obligation, it says, to always respond to the needs to bless others with what we have been given. Some have more, some have less, but whatever God has given you, use it to bless others and to fulfill their needs. It said Jesus would not neglect a man's need, even if it was on Sunday, or the Father's plan for him to meet that need, even though it was on the Sabbath. And because Jesus did not comply with the traditions of the Pharisees, it said they began <laughs> plotting his death with the Herodians. The Herodians were Hellenistic Jews. So it was Jewish. It was a Jewish uh, traditions, but it was, had the elements of Greek culture in it. So they became the Hellenistic Jews, and they supported King Herod. And so they were called the Herodians, and they were more of a political group than they were a religious group. So ironically, here we have Jesus doing good, saving people in the synagogue, and they got off in their little corner and started plotting Jesus' death on that day. The Pharisees were using that day to plot his death. It said, at times, even people who profess to be, uh, embrace Christ's rules and they profess to be Christians, they will assume limitations on their life. Now, I didn't go into these. This is, I just put up there. These were things we can go over after our lesson, but, or we can get you a copy if you want. It's why fast? You may fast as the Holy Spirit is leading you in a new direction. You are seeking the Lord. Most times, the, the simplest form of a fast is just to abstain from food for a period of time for a specific reason. So I said, you can fast to hear directions from God clearly. You can fast to help your church find a set forth leaders. You may fast in faith to overcome evil spirits. All of these ones, they give you the scripture for it. So if this is a need that you have, then this is you know, scripturally based for why you would have that, uh, why you would be going on that fast. The one that I wanted to draw your attention to right now, though, is let you discuss this. It said, a husband and a wife and their children, ages 9, 11, and 14, have recently began attending your church. The wife's in your Sunday school class. You invite the family out for dinner, that after worship service. But she says, we don't eat out in restaurants on Sunday. So when you ask in surprise, she tells you that her husband insists on the following routine. You have to eat all your meals at home so as not to cause someone else to work. Who's fixing Sunday dinner? They cannot watch television or read anything except the Bible or Christian material. Everyone in the family must go take a nap on Sunday afternoon, and the children often complain, and so you have to punish them because they didn't take a nap. They cannot have guests in their home on Sunday so as not to distract their focus on God. She also mentions that a neighbor recently came over on Sunday needing to jump for his car, and her husband said, I'd love to help you. Come back tomorrow, and I'm going jump you. So, these seem silly, but you know, some people abide by things like this. And as our lesson would tell us, there's times when we have Christians, and they profess to be Christians, but they allow uh, what God can do in their life to be limited because of that's the way their family has always done it. I'm sure they got this from someone else. They may be that, you know, her parents did, or his parents did this. And so we are very limited in what can, we don't get to take benefit from all that God would give us. Well, Sandy, uh, I know everybody in here can remember when we followed most of that. Yeah, yes, yeah. Indeed. And uh, 
Like you say, there wasn't any, you know, you couldn't do anything that was work except the wife could fix dinner and That's clean different. the kitchen. That's, That's different. different. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we were in then Israel, you yeah. remember we were there on a Sunday in the hotel and they allowed one elevator to operate because uh, what was considered work is if you make fire. Electricity makes fire. And so you could not. They did allow because, you know, tourist thing, you know, one elevator to operate. It was kind of a, a what was a, you know, one of those back elevators or something. If you remember when we were in that freight hotel. Freight elevator. Yeah, freight elevator. But, <laughs> oh, uh, you know, you got to keep the tourism going. But, you know, they, they shut down everything. Uh, but we do remember when everything was shut down on Sunday. And I always wondered, I, I can remember as a kid hearing the, um, and talk about how wonderful the hospital food was. On, you know, people would go up there and eat on Sunday. Well, that was the only cafe, cafeteria, that was open. Everything was shut down. You know, we had the, uh, what's the laws? Blue, Blue laws. Blue laws. Blue laws. Blue you yeah. couldn't sell. And I think some of these laws might still be in effect because yes, I think we've gotten so far the other way <laughs> that we don't even, yeah, Sunday's just another day. But then you've got people yeah. that if it, Sunday might be the only day that they can actually buy their groceries. So I can understand there has right. to be a balance. But yeah, we remember when it was yeah. that. We're all of that age that we remember that you just didn't go shopping on Sunday for sure. No. Yeah, nothing was open. Yeah. <laughs> I want the record to show I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse you. <laughs> but oh, this, no, no, no. this is this is another reason it says while we cannot base our faith on the, the unbelief of others, so we must build our own faith based on belief biblical accounts of Jesus through his word and his works. You know, that's why in Philippians 2, 12 through 18, it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not by works, and Jesus isn't going to strike you dead, you know, if you don't do a certain thing. But on that note, when your witness still has to be balanced. You know, we preach God's good, God's all of these things. Well, God is good. But it also tells us about his judgment, his anger, his justice, his wrath. And if God is good, then all of that is good too. And Jesus wants us to be drawn because he is good. He wants us to be drawn to him and be willing to do what we need to do to follow him. And God will work in us if we let him. And if we let him, then he will allow us to willingly and actively desire to do his will. And if he can't call you, and get you to come to him through his love, then he's willing, he loves you enough that he'll do it through his judgment. Because that's why the wrath is there and you have to have that balance in your faith. But God is good and he loves you so much that he's willing to die on the cross for you. He's willing to do whatever it takes. And that's why he has put off his coming. But it seems like every day, it's getting closer and closer, doesn't yeah. it? It's, it's amazing. Right. Okay, I, I don't have anything else to add to that. Let's bow our heads. Jesus, you are so good to us and you love us so much. And we thank you for giving us the word and making it real in us. And we thank you that you've taught us how to follow your word and given us these examples so that we know that there's other people just like us. There are people with faults and you still protected them. There are people who have sinned and grossly sinned, but it wasn't too much that you couldn't overcome it with what you did on the cross. We claim victory for everything we're going through today. We claim, we proclaim protection for everything that we're going through today. And we believe if we trust in you and believe in you and lean not to our own understanding, that you will guide us in everything that we do. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good job. Excellent job. Excellent job. Excellent job.